<laughs> Thank you all for being all right. here. I'm Theresia DeVrome, and this is my wonderful, brilliant colleague, um, Julia Lee. We're both in the English department. And um, beautiful. part of our theme tonight will be about mentorship a little bit. So Julia was Professor Gates's best student at Harvard, <laughs> which he only mentioned about 12 times this evening, was teacher's pet, you know. <laughs> and Professor Gates was Professor Schwenka's student at Cambridge in England. And um, <laughs> I feel that one of the greatest privileges of my life is to become friends with Professor Schwenka and <laughs> has been such a great influence on my sense of what it means to be a writer or to be an artist or to have a moral sense and a core and um, an extraordinary relationship. So we're going to just chit chat for a little bit and we'll have a little bit more music, chit chat, and then there we are. So I thought that one of the things the two of you so have in common is that you're storytellers. Um, youth before age. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was there a question? Yes, in there? meaning that um, I think that even when you write academic, you're both academics, you're both professors, you're both teachers, but when you write your academic work, and you're a playwright and a poet and a memoirist, and you as well, you're always telling stories. Yes. And that's very different from a lot of academic pursuits sometimes, right? Well, my, my father, whom Wally knew, um, was a fabulous storyteller. He was uh, hilariously... Funny, my father was so funny, he made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved stories, and he communicated in stories. And where I grew up in eastern West Virginia, everybody told stories. But if you, uh, it's a little bit like Zora Neale Hurston when she went back to Eatonville in Florida. But first of all, Professor Harris, I had never heard the prodigal son sung outside of Walden Methodist Church till today. And that is my favorite, favorite hymn. They, the choir sang it at my mother's funeral. Uh, so, uh, God bless you for doing this. And when, um, when I was a graduate student, I was his student. I, I studied history at Yale um, as an undergraduate. And then I got a fellowship to go to the, the University of I got a Mellon fellowship. I was the first African American to get a Mellon fellowship. My father, and I called him, and I called my parents. When I was growing up, I wanted to go to Harvard and Yale, or Yale, and I wanted to go to Oxford and Cambridge, because on TV, that's where they said smart people had gone. And my, my father's first cousin had graduated from Harvard Law School in 1949, so that was sort wow. of in the family um, lore. And his wife, who was black, got a PhD in comparative literature in 1955, so that was sort of that. Then I wanted to go to Oxford and Cambridge, because Rhodes Scholars went to Oxford, and um, so I applied to all these fellowships. I applied to Theresia seven fellowships. Wow. And I was a finalist for all these fellowships, and I wasn't getting any. I was a finalist for the Rhodes, the Marshall, the Fulbright. I, so my girlfriend, who was Linda Darling, who was the, some of you know Linda Darling Hammond up at Stanford. We were junior item at uh, <laughs> Yale. And she said, just go in there and be yourself. Stop trying to pretend to be somebody you're not. So I went in, I was my own, um, little funky self, and I got the fellowship, I got the Mellon Fellowship, and it was one of the happiest days of my life, and I went back to Calhoun College at Yale, and I called my parents, and my father answered the phone, I said, Daddy, Daddy, put Mama on the extension phone, remember? In those days, you didn't have two phones, you had a phone and the extension phone, and she was upstairs, and Daddy was downstairs, and I said, Mama, Daddy, you'll never believe it, you'll never believe it, I got a Mellon Fellowship, I'm going to Cambridge, I have a Mellon Fellowship. And Daddy said, I said, I'm the first Afro-American, remember this is 1973, to get, to get a Mellon Fellowship, and without missing a beat, Daddy said, you're the first Negro to get a Mellon Fellowship? I said, yeah, Daddy. He said, huh, they're going to call it the Watermelon Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> That's my father. So when I came of age as a graduate student, post-structuralism and deconstruction, they were the discourses that were reigning supreme. And my brother, I only have one brother, no sisters. My brother's five years older, Paul. He's an oral surgeon. And he heard me speak, and he said, when are you going to um, write something that mama and daddy can understand? Mm. <laughs> and that really, um, that moved me. And I went down right at the same time I was asked to uh, give a talk at an honors seminar at Howard University. I completely forgotten this. And so 
I gave a talk called Binary Oppositions in Chapter <laughs> One of Frederick Douglass's <laughs> Narrative, okay? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, I was in my stride, man. I was reconstructing and deconstructing and everything was cool. And um, at the end of my hour presentation, I had very polite applause. Uh, and then I said, I'll take questions. And a young black man in the back, it was, everybody was black, you know, it was Howard University. He, I said, yes, sir. And he said, yeah, brother, all we want to know is, was Booker T. Washington Uncle Tom or not? <laughs> <laughs> that was a polite way for the tradition to tell me to, um, as Alice Walker put it, stop talking as if I had books in my mouth. And I, so I tra trained my students. We had to know about theory, but you have to know how to say it in a language that your parents can understand. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us. So. Absolutely. No, you know, when you're speaking, um, saying what you wanted to do, what you ended up doing, um, I suddenly remembered something I'd forgotten for donkey years, that in fact it was to an American university uh, that I first applied when I decided I wanted to study literature. Mm -hmm. And why did I pick uh, America? I was told that America was awash with scholarships, whereas the British were very mean with theirs. <laughs> and you hardly ever could extract a scholarship out of a, a British university. So I remember now that as I was leaving school, I applied to, you said you applied to seven fellowships. I think, uh, you know, post, post was quite cheap at the time. <laughs> so I think I mailed at least 77 applications <laughs> to various universities. I just got the directory out and started applying. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, I got the admissions all right, but not one offer of a scholarship. <laughs> so I went back to, uh, to my university college, and fortunately, I was able to get um, um, uh, a scholarship, which... Uh, took me to Leeds. Now, how did I get to Leeds? By the time uh, the scholarship came from my you know, um, colonial government, not the British, but the, who were just moving slowly towards independence at the time, by the time I got the, uh, the scholarship, I got that first, before I had a place to go to. So the um, question was, where did I want to go? Now, you know, the three main uh, universities that we knew of, we colonial uh, creatures at the time were Oxford, Cambridge, and London. Mm -hmm. And my university college was actually a part of London. So I said, well, I'm already in the University of London, so let me try the other two. Um, tried Oxford, tried Cambridge, mailed the letters. I never even heard from them. <laughs> <laughs> So I brought out the, um, the map, <laughs> and I remember and I sat with one of my um, uh, teachers, uh, brought out the map, and I remember he asking me, why are you looking at uh, a map? I thought you said you wanted to go and uh, study um, English literature. Um, what has geographic got, geography got to do with it? So I said, well, I've heard about what happens in England, that the sun never shines, <laughs> permanently cold, but I remember my geography, and I know that the further you went from the equator, the colder it got. <laughs> so this is a map of England, <laughs> where my scholarship is supposed to take me. So this is the equator. I'm looking for whichever <laughs> university was closest to the equator, because that's where I'm going. <laughs> that's great. And I got admitted to uh, Edinburgh, and I got admitted to another one, both of them in the wilds of Scotland. <laughs> and so I came further down, and well, Leeds wasn't exactly on the equator, but it was south of uh, Edinburgh, and uh, the other one, the was in Sheffield. I can mean, remember now. Aberdeen, Aberdeen, Aberdeen. Aberdeen. <laughs> so I said, Leeds, there we come. And that's how I got to Leeds. That's great. N closest in England to the equator. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm back. also wondering, you know, you, you've been doing these projects where you're talking to people about their stories. You're, uh -huh. you're investing in their stories. And when you wrote probably one of the most well-known plays that you've written, Death and the King's Horseman, it was reputedly based on a true story that circulated mm -hmm. right. about what happened in colonial times in Nigeria. And you're looking for the truth of a story, and then you're also embellishing the story in some other mm -hmm. way. Teresa is talking about Death and the King's Horseman. And when Wally um, received the Nobel Prize in 1986, becoming the first person of African descent to get the Nobel Prize in Literature. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was his guest in Stockholm. What? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. You want to know how exclusive <laughs> that was? And the Nigerian government sent a jumbo jet of Africans to... to um, <laughs> Stockholm has never been the same, man. We rocked. <laughs> The Grand Hotel was rocking when, when uh, it, it was fabulous. So I was his student, and um, in, in Oxford it's called um, your tutor, and Cambridge it's your supervisor. So he was my supervisor, and he was introducing me to African literature and mythology. And I'd see him every couple of weeks. And he said, you know, I'm in the middle of a project, um, and I'll let you know when I finish, but I can't see you until I get finished. And in those days, my students can't believe this, but there weren't, were no phones. You didn't have a TV in your rooms at Cambridge and you didn't have a phone. If you wanted to communicate with someone, you wrote a, a letter and you put it in the campus mail and then they would respond. Very civilized, very <laughs> civilized. And um, so I didn't hear from him. And then I got a note saying um, to come see him. And he didn't tell me what he was working on. Um, but shortly after that, uh, he asked if I was free on a certain date. And he had a drama troupe come and to do a reading of this play. And um, he didn't tell me anything about the play, but there was another, an African uh, student, and uh, he and I were the audience for the very first reading wow. of Death and the King's Horseman. Wow. It was, and that is the play that he wrote in a week. <laughs> in a week. At this play is so great. A thousand years from now, people will still be reading Death and the King's Horseman. This is the person who has created a classic work of world literature mm. that is timeless and sublime. Woo! Well, uh, I think there are two um, um, narratives of interest surrounding this play. Uh, the first was how it came about. I'd heard about this real, uh, it's a truthful story. I uh, heard about it for some time, and uh, I was going to work on it. But we had um, a Yoruba dramatist, his name is Duro Ladipo, and he wrote and directed, produced uh, a play based on it called uh, uh, Oba Obawaja. And for me, it is such a beautiful play that he wrote. In fact, that play um, uh, t toured I remember Germany came to the States briefly. I think La Mama Theatre, I can't remember now. But anyway, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of it. A playwright, you know, my mind, had written it in Yoruba and really uh, created a beautiful, tragic uh, spectacle on stage. And so that was it. Until I became a fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge. I used to go down for my coffee every morning, and on, um, on a plinth at the top of the stairs was the bust of Winston Churchill, you know, the great colonialist. What we have, we hold. Um, <laughs> and each time I came down, I just remember the entire history of uh, British colonialism, colonialism in general and what, as far as I was concerned, the enormous damage they did to Africans. And um, I would look at this bust, and there was I enjoying the hospitality of this college named after him. And I had this overwhelming, overwhelming impulse to just give it a shove and send it <laughs> crashing down. Because <coughs> this play was about you know, a clash of interests, clash of values, and so on between the British colonial powers and 
uh, traditional society. So it was an overwhelming uh, thing, but I managed to, uh, to suppress it. <laughs> uh, and eventually one day it occurred to me, well, Joe Lightfoot had written this play already, the play about 10 years or so, and this story came back, came back fully, and I had to get it out of my system. And so, you know these things, when it was ready, it was ready. I thought about it for quite a while before I sat down to it, and I locked myself in, the, in my flat apartment there. In fact, it nearly got me thrown out of uh, Cambridge. It wouldn't have done it, but at least uh, there would have been quite an incident, because <laughs> the cleaner, the housekeeper, the housekeeper insisted she wanted to come and clean the room. After the second day, she kept knocking. I didn't tell you this. <laughs> she would knock me door and insist that I was ruining her work by not letting her come into my room. <laughs> and I think the third day, when things really got to a peak, where she knocked on the door, I opened the door and said, Get out of my sight, <laughs> you racist cow. <laughs> <laughs> and she went and reported to the housemaster. <clears throat> and he came afterwards to see me and said, the woman said, I called her a racist cow. I said, yes. I said, because I'm convinced that if it had been a white fellow in there and said, please don't disturb me, Put, do not disturb on the door. She would not insist. She would not have insisted on coming, knock on the door. I said, so she is a racist cow. And if you like, <laughs> I would drop my fellowship right now and go away. <laughs> and after the second story, I have never told you this before. No, I didn't know but that. But I thought it's about time <laughs> I didn't know you got that. properly educated. Uh, okay. Right. 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 <laughs> anyway, we finally sorted it out. I called the woman. And I said, look, I can clean the room. I said, where I come from, I clean my own room. And when I tell you I don't need you to clean my room, that means you get off. I can <laughs> clean other rooms. Full stop. Anyway, I thought my wife was last time. But the great thing about the play is that you would think a lesser playwright would have made it a play about the tension between... Um, tradition and modernity, the Yoruba way of life, the British colonial way of life. But the, the, the reason for the outcome of the play, and it has um, tragic, two tragic outcomes at least, is indeterminate. You never know, there is a, the king is dead. It takes place in 24 hours, it's a classic play, right? Um, the king is dead. The horseman of the king is the leading noble of the court. And his job, he's, he's the favorite of all the nobles in the court because his, he lives in order to die. He is to die 30 days after the king is dead. To, he's the horseman of the king. And his job is he's to dance himself to death. And when there's a full moon and he is to lead his master, the king, through the, the gate of transition to the, the other world. And at the precise moment when he is to transition, doing this beautiful rhythmic death, he vacillates just long enough. And you know that something's going to go wrong on this day because he has a, a, any wish that he wants when the play opens. And he sees a virgin um, betrothed, a woman betrothed, and he takes her as his wife. So it is, and he is, it's the day he's supposed to die. So it's the marriage of Eros and Thanatos, if you think about it. And you know that's an act of hubris. And you know this is not going to go, this is not going to go well. Uh, and it doesn't. And it, it's so, so you never know why he fails to make the transition. 
because the British colonials are trying to break the door down to keep this savage ritual from taking place because it's a suicide, right? But he also has tasted the, you know, the, the earth. You know, he has the, the, the earth in his fingers because um, he's married on the day that he's supposed to die. You know, he's taking another wife and another man's wife. She's betrothed. And you know that this is not good. So it's, that is why he's a genius. And you yeah. never know why this guy um, doesn't die. And ultimately, um, he does die. But as the, the lady of the um, marketplace says, but oh, how late it is. But oh, how late it is. It's great. So, Professor Gates, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, how you first... Was it through Wole that you became interested in Africa? Or could you tell us a story about how you first developed an interest in I got studying? interested in Africa in 1960 when I was, uh, that was my 10th year, I was born in 1950. And that was the great year of African independence. I always forget if it was 16 countries or 17 countries or 19 countries became independent, including Nigeria. Um, and I was in the fifth grade. And I memorized the names of all, we had a weekly, um, a, a map of current events that would come. And um, there would be like 10 stories and they would put the numbers on the countries. And that was Patrice Labumba and Chambe uh, and the Belgians and the Congo and, and all those other things that were unfolding on the African continent. And I memorized the names of each of the African countries and the names of the, their leaders. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so, well, I memorized it the way that Walter Cronkite said them on TV or Walter Winchell or, who, or whoever it was. And um, that same year, Reader's Digest, there was a story. We got Reader's Digest every month and Reader's Digest condensed books. Remember those? Mm -hmm. And there was a story in Reader's Digest about a little African boy who had walked across the equator and it ended up in, I don't know, Seattle or someplace and been saved by missionaries and then uh, had been fleeing a war or something. And I was intrigued with that idea of walking um, across the equator. And so when I was 19, and there was no reason for me to be, nobody in my hometown was interested in Africa, nobody in my household was interested in Africa. Um, and when I was at, um, I went, went off to Yale um, Yale had a program called Five Year BA, and between your sophomore and junior year, 12 people were chosen. It was very competitive. And if you were chosen, you got a gap year, halfway through your undergraduate education. And I was chosen, and I was pre-med. I was raised to be a doctor. <laughs> you know, my mother, uh, we, well, we're, we're here in the, the uh, blessed, uh, the, the, our room has been blessed already, right? For my mother, God rest her soul, in heaven was the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, and a medical doctor. You know, that, was, <laughs> that was Skippy Gates was going to be a medical doctor. For Christmas, I got a stethoscope. You know, <laughs> a birthday dissecting kit. And so I went off to Tanzania to work in an mi Anglican mission hospital. Gates is Episcopalian, an Anglican mission hospital in the central Tanzania, um, uh, in the bush. And um, that year, um, I flew from, you know, in, in, in those days, air miles, they didn't have frequent flyer miles, you had air miles. So if Wally's JFK and that man over there is Dar es Salaam Airport, I happen to remember there are 11,000 air miles between JFK and Dar es Salaam. So, and you could stop anywhere in between. And I had Europe on $5 a day, remember that book? <laughs> Europe on $5 a day, backpack, a pair of sandals, blue jeans, you know, three books and uh, $500 for the year. And I went from New York to London, to Paris, to Amsterdam, to Rome, to Athens, to Tel Aviv, to Addis Ababa, to Nairobi, to Dar es Salaam over two months. <laughs> and uh, then I went out to the bush and I lived there from August till, uh, till December and moved into Dar es Salaam. And I wanted to go to Zanzibar, so I'm at the dock and one night we sailed a Dow, which is a fishing boat, Arab fishing boat, D-H-O-W. And there was this white guy who had just graduated from Harvard and been kicked out of then Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. And he, we met there, 
and, you know, for a dollar or something, you could, you could hop a ride on a fishing mm -hmm. boat and go to Zanzibar. And halfway to Zanzibar with this big, beautiful sky, where you could see the Southern Cross, you know, which you can't see up here. Uh, I told him, he told me his fantasy was to go from Cape to Cairo, like Cecil Rhodes wanted to build the railroad. And my fantasy, because of that story I'd read when I was uh, in 1960, was to hitchhike across the equator. We flipped a coin, I won, and we hitchhiked across the equator. <laughs> I went from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean without ever leaving the ground. And this guy who did it with me um, went to law school and then became an Episcopal priest. And my wife says, it's a good thing he's a priest because nobody would believe I ever hitchhiked across <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> So when I met him, I had been across the continent and I had uh, visited six African countries, including Nigeria, uh, just after he was, for those of you who don't know, he was in prison during the Biafra Civil War for 27 months, 24 months in solitary confinement. And um, I went to Nigeria in um, February of 1971. And where were you in February 1971? I think I'd moved because I'd been released from prison then and I went into self-exile to just to get away for some time. So around that time, I was just an itinerant lecturer. I don't think I had a particular, mostly in the south of France, I think in mm -hmm. Belmonte, where I borrowed um, a cottage from Gerald Moore. And that's why I wrote uh, The Man Died, Prison Memoirs. Yeah, so I think The Man I was Died. In that's his prison memoirs. So he gets out of jail. He, uh, 27 months, he writes, uh, out of prison, sorry, he writes his prison memoirs, and he publishes them, and they try to put him in prison all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why he's in England when I got the fellowship, and we ended up at Cambridge. God works in mysterious mm. ways. Isn't that true? Oh. I've got a question that um, is about this idea of ancestry, which as somebody who helps other people find their roots and figure out their ancestry. Who, for both of you, Professor Shoyenka perhaps first, who do you see as your ancestor? Who do you see as um, the person that you see yourself following in the footsteps of? I have a feeling that it's an amalgam of a composite of many uh, individuals, personalities, and so on. And my mind, went almost immediately to an uncle of mine, uh, whose biography, in fact, I was going to write before he died on me. Uh, he represented certain, he was a, a force, a traditional force, and yet, yet, he was quite sophisticated um, as a Western educated person. He combined in the most uh, astonishing way, uh, shall we say, the best of tradition, you know, uh, whether the arts, uh, whether uh, ceremonials, uh, human relationships, the sense of community, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And he was uh, the principal of a, of a school I first attended before I went to government college, what you call the high school. I began high school somewhere, I finished somewhere else. And uh, you, you all actually know him indirectly because he was uncle to Fela. <laughs> he was father to Fela, and oh. he, he was my <laughs> uncle. As, uh. Um, uh, and he was a disciplinarian. He, the two years I was there, I was happy to get out of that school. He beat, <laughs> he beat the living shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, was, it was both as principal of that college and as my uncle, he had double right to beat me. And I think he didn't lack for cause in those uh, two years. But I loved him. I admired him a lot. He was musical and he was also fierce, a fierce anti-colonial. Mm. He and his wife, Bere, Mrs. Ransom Kuti, his wife led uh, the women in their rebellion against uh, a feudal tyrant, the Alaki of Abe Okuta. Uh, I acted as courier among the... <laughs> so I admired the two of them. But he fascinated me a lot more because there was just something so... He, he was dynamo in itself, and yet he could be very gentle. 
And he had a remarkable sense of justice. And his notion of justice was this. If you were accused of anything, he created a court and you had to defend yourself. Even he was convinced, if he had seen that student actually stealing or beating up a junior people, uh, if that individual, that criminal, could argue successfully and convince him, he freed him. <laughs> it didn't good. matter if he caught, as he did very often, because he also had a poultry, as he caught some of the senior boys stealing his chicken, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And he said, all right, what happened there? If you made a good case, he acquitted and discharged you, and that was it. Wow. I was a very strange person. <laughs> and I, I, admire, I admired him a lot. He was, he was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, he died. But because he died, and I wanted to capture that whole atmosphere, I wrote Ake, mm. The uh, Years of Childhood. Yeah. He was the inspiration for that book. Oh, mm. that's great. Because I just I missed the opportunity of narrating my background through him. Mm. So I just stuck to the background. And that was Ake, Years of Childhood. Oh, so I consider him a real ancestor. So what were you doing to, to um, cause this Warren good man to beat you? Uh, All right. Let me tell you how ridiculous the man could be. I want this the man had a notion of, uh, first he was into horticulture, nature, and so on. You know, I took after him in that respect. And the football field, or any lawn at all, must be kept green. But not merely kept green. It had to be uh, populated by what you called good grass. <laughs> there was good grass, non marijuana, no. <laughs> and bad grass. And we, as school pupils, we had our portions of those lawns and those fields, which we were supposed to keep clean, green, <laughs> and without bad grass. <laughs> But I found the distinction so ludicrous. <laughs> and I would even sometimes attempt to hide the, bag, the good bad grass on them. And his eyes were so sharp and would home in. I mean, we had several students, over 100 students with their own patches of, uh, of lawn. He would come to mine. And then, what is that? <laughs> You so, you just deserve, things like that. You deserve to be beaten. Oh, come on. Good grass, bad grass. Go ahead. Grass is a grass. Uh, he's a carry. That's great. And so he was fellow Ransom Cootie's father. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And I love just rambling around the woods, you know, just yeah. next to the school he, he when I was supposed to be plucking the bad grass. <laughs> so, fellow was your first cousin. Yeah, that was my fellow first was your cousin. First. What yeah. about that for good genes, huh? Yeah. And I gave him his first turn on a stage, because when I had my night at British, uh, uh, at uh, the Royal Court Theatre in London, mm. and I had a night of poetry, I invited Fela to come and play the saxophone. Oh, wow. A compliment to my poetry. Wow, that's and that great. that was his first appearance on stage. Did he give you royalties <laughs> subsequently for launching his career? Well, no. <laughs> British theatre. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Professor Gates? Who do you see? Uh, you know, my, my, I, it took me a lot of years to realize, but my first um, image of a writer um, was right under my nose, my own household. It was my mother. Mm -hmm. I always already said that my father was a fabulous storyteller, and, and he was. But my mother, uh, well, 1957, the schools... Where I grew up is halfway between Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C., in eastern West Virginia, on the Potomac River, in the Allegheny Mountains. And it turns out, um, now that genealogists have... Uh, I'm the most uh, <laughs> genealogically studied black man in the history of the world, <laughs> and the most DNA tested. It turns out my family on both sides, my mother's side and father's side, have lived in the Potomac Valley in the Allegheny Mountains for 200 years. My family never moved. I'm a Redmond on my mother's side, and I'm a Redmond on my, my, um, my father's side. Um, and my, 
so there are a handful of black people there in, in West Virginia, period, but most of the black people live in the coal fields in the southern part of the state. And this is the, near Harpers Ferry. And you all know about Harpers Ferry because of, because of John Brown. And so Brown v. Boards in 1954. Schools integrated in my county in 1955 without Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King or mm -hmm. anything. So I went to the white school starting in 1956. In 1957, my mother was elected as the first colored secretary of the Piedmont PTA. And that was <laughs> a big deal. And every month, all the black people in town uh, mostly the women, mm -hmm. would get all dressed up like it was going Sunday, like going to church, and they would go and watch my beautiful mother read the minutes from the previous <laughs> PTA meeting. And I would be there, I'd have my little white shirt, my little tie on, and I'd look up at this goddess, you know, reading. And not only did, did she become the first colored secretary of the PTA, um, representing the race, of course, um, she, would, she would write the obituaries for all the black people in the Potomac Valley mm. when they died. The newspaper would call, say so-and-so died, and she would write their obituary. And she would read that obituary as a eulogy uh, in church. And uh, I would, before I started school, I would go to all these funerals with my mother. And uh, if daddy was off from work, he would go. And I remember one time, and she would just, you know, my mother had the capacity to uh, name uh, the person that you wanted to be in your heart hmm. before the world had prevented you from becoming mm. that person. She knew how to send a person off. And I remember we were walking home. I was just a little kid, and I was holding my parents' hands, and we were coming back from the church. And my father, she called him Gates, and her name was Pauline. And uh, uh, Daddy said, uh, uh, Pauline, you did, a, you did a good job. You did a good job today. And she said, really, Gates? And he said, yeah. He said, at one point, he said, I started to stand up, open the casket to see if that son of a bitch was still <laughs> in the... <laughs> <laughs> And I laughed, and she laughed, and that was like getting A plus on, on her eulogy. And it took me years to realize that, in part, the compulsion I have for genealogy came from my mother doing people's obituaries. Mm -hmm. That was the first mm -hmm. glimpse, you know, assessing a life and doing a and uh, uh, doing a biography. And in fact, my um, I did my first family tree. I know the day I did my first family tree. It was July 3rd, 1960, because it was the day after we buried Edward St. Lawrence Gates, who was my grandfather, Pop Gates. And um, the, uh, my father took my brother and me up to look at his, um, up to the open casket. It was the first time I was that close to a corpse, which I, was terrifying um, to me. And then we went over to, we buried him, um, and my, my grandfather looked white. I mean, he could have passed for white. And I remember standing there at the casket, thinking how absurd he looked, because he looked like, we called him Casper behind his back, he was so white. <laughs> so you can imagine, if he was, looked like a ghost with blood coursing through his veins, you could imagine how white he looked dead. <laughs> he looked like he had been coated with alabaster and sprinkled with baby powder. And I just thought he looked ridiculous and I'm standing there holding my father's hand looking at him and I heard this noise from my father and I thought my father was laughing at how ridiculously white his father looked and I started to laugh too and I looked up and my father the noise I heard my father was, was crying. crying so I thought my life had ended that this was the most embarrassing thing that I ever could do laughing at the open casket of my grandfather but fortunately I was you know a little kid nobody even um, noticed me so when I started to cry, right? So it was very traumatic. And after we buried my father, we came back to the Gates family home. And my father took my brother and me upstairs to his parents' bedroom. And we still own that house. My cousin Johnny Gates owns that house. And there's a sun porch off the bedroom. And he took my brother and me out on the sun porch. And there was an armoire there, and he opened it up. And it was full of bank ledgers, because my grandfather was a janitor at the First National Bank in Cumberland. 
And it turns out he was stealing these bank ledgers and using them as scrapbooks. No. And my father was looking furiously for something in one of these scrapbooks. So he took out three, four, five, six, seven of these bank ledgers. And he's on the floor and he's turning the pages. And finally, he finds what he's looking for. And he said, to you boys, look. And we looked over his shoulder and it was obituary, an obituary dated January 6, 1888. And it said, died this day in Cumberland, Maryland, Jane Gates, an estimable colored woman. And then he pulled a, a picture of her out between the leaves of this scrapbook. It was a sepia photograph. She was a slave, he said, till slavery was abolished in Maryland in 1864. And um, she was a midwife, and she was in her midwifery costume. And he said, she's the oldest Gates we've ever recorded. I never want you to forget her name, and I never want you to forget her face. Mm -hmm. And my brother and me, we, we looked at, my brother and I looked at each other, and that's all my father said, and then he put the scrapbooks, closed the scrapbook, and put all the six mm -hmm. bank ledgers back in the armoire. We went downstairs, had the repass, and we drove home 25 miles away. And the last thing I did um, before I went to bed, because I had a red Webster's uh, dictionary, and that obituary, remember, had said, died the same in Cumberland, Maryland, Jane Gates, an estimable colored woman. And the last thing I did before I went to bed was look up the word estimable because I didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. And the next day, after the colored picnic, because it was right on the eve of the 4th of July, on the way home, I asked my father if he'd buy me a composition book. And we stopped at Red Bull's newsstand, and he bought me a composition book. And that night, in front of our little 12-inch black and white TV, I did my first family tree. Wow. I interviewed my parents mm -hmm because I wanted to know how someone who looked like me with my phenotype could have, a, as a grandfather, a man who looked so white, we called him Casper behind <laughs> his back, and then how he could be the grandson of a woman who clearly looked African, of African descent, who was this funny looking person who was something mm -hmm. called a midwife. And I was able to go back to my great, great grandparents on my mother's side, and on my father's side, to Jane Gates. And Jane Gates' children were fathered by a white man and she only told her children that they all had the same father, but she never identified and never revealed his identity. She took the secret of his identity um, to the grave. And now, a genetic genealogist purely using DNA, a brilliant woman named C.C. Moore, has found the identity of my great-great-grandfather, and we're revealing it next season in Finding <laughs> Your Roots. Oh, my God! <laughs> nice. <laughs> <That was bad. laughs> that was a nice wind-up. <laughs> so, so, just know, knowing a little bit about your biography with your mother, your mother, I think you called Wild Christian, is that correct? Wild yeah. Christian. And she was very important to you in terms of your activism mm. politically. Yeah. Um, before I answer that question, please, there's something which confession which I won't skip to make sure I please remind me you about it. Make it. Yes, I want are to make a public are you, confession. Are you a priest? <laughs> are, you a priest? Yeah, yeah. are you a priest? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's my priest. <laughs> um, well, I call her wild Christian because her Christianity was wild. <laughs> <laughs> she was on such terms with the, the supreme deity <laughs> whom, she, whom she called Papa God. <laughs> and um, we were, I grew up in a Christian household, and she was a petty trader. But one thing she never joked with was her Christianity. She was also uh, an evangelist, if you like. On certain days, they would all go out and try and convert the market women and market uh, the traders go to the markets, the Bible, and I used to follow uh, <laughs> around, I had no choice, and I used to feel so sorry for these, uh, <laughs> for these people when and my mother at the head, you know, they rolled down the holy <laughs> God gospel on their heads, and I used to watch this. In the market, especially the traditional part of the market, we had all the various... Um, the herbs and so on, which were considered, of course, pagan, right. even traditional healing, 
but at the same time you had dried uh, squirrels maybe or dried rodents or bats mm -hmm. or whatever so you, you had you know different kind of things and they would home in that very section of the market, which I found the most colorful, the most interesting. <laughs> that was a disaster as a Christian from childhood, <laughs> you know. Even though I was a chorister, I had to go there. I enjoyed singing in church, but I don't think I ever really was, you know, I, I don't think, I think the holy water at baptism somehow was polluted. <laughs> when, when came to my, but she was very conscientious in terms of her bringing. She also was also wielded a, a good um, cane. Uh, <laughs> but more than that, we were terrified of my father. Mm. He was a cooler, calmer person, <laughs> but his discipline was worse. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was also a great uh, one, uh, a lover of um, uh, so cottons and, uh, and flowers and roses <laughs> and uh -huh. so on. And I loved helping him tend uh, all those things. So she was great. And she was the right, she was the lieutenant of Mrs. Kuti, the mother of Fela, when um, mm -hmm. when Mrs. Kuti, uh, name was uh, nickname was Bere, when she led the women, and uh, they succeeded in uh, toppling the um, the Alaki of Abelkuta. Yeah. And uh, since I was very small, they used me as courier between the women uh, when they laid siege mm -hmm. to the um, to the palace, demanding the abdication. I, I enjoyed it enormously. Um, uh, I think uh, that aspect of conflict is something which appealed to me. But my mother was right in the middle of it. But yes. you, you also have a real deep connection to Yoruba gods and the mm. tradition of... Yes, again, from childhood, I yeah. was uh, more attracted to the traditional deities. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, that was probably, possibly due to the influence of my grandfather, uh, on the father's side, uh, who was a traditionalist, before the poor man was converted to Christianity. Uh, you know, he <laughs> just couldn't stand the onslaught any longer. <laughs> and and, and he, he, he gave up his, uh, his Yoruba name and became Uzziah. Yeah, I think that was the name they gave him. <laughs> but that, that really, his, his belief, his worldview, and so on, resonated with me right from childhood. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, thank God. <laughs> 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 my, my, um, my sort of guardian companion deity, because I'm not really a worshiper. I'm not, I don't worship any deities, but the, my companion avatar, if you like, or demiurge, is Ogun, Ogun. Mm. Uh, has always been mm. the god of uh, iron, of metallurgy, in general, of poetry, uh, a contradiction also, like I am, mm -hmm. um, a lover of solitude, and at the same time, constantly on the active side. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Oh, Don't forget, I want him to make a public confession. Oh, yeah. Oh, what's your oh, are public you winding up? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Okay, yeah. Since, yeah. since this is okay. a... <laughs> <Confession>. <laughs> Since this Catholic is a mentor, oh <laughs> mentee session, uh -oh. Let me I want the whole world to know <laughs> Let me drink how he what? deceived me into accepting him as a student. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll simply ask him, how is your moon too these days? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're terrible. You're terrible. <laughs> so I get to Cambridge. <laughs> And remember, I'm going to come back and go to med school, right? But I, I wanted to go to Oxford, Harvey, Yale, Oxford, and Cambridge. So I got the fellowship, so I'm at Cambridge. So I was going to get just a throwaway degree. Not a throwaway <laughs> degree, but... <laughs> so, Great, thanks. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, throwaway degree, exactly. <laughs> I had already, I had always loved literature. Remember, I had a BA in history, but I took some pre-med courses. And I, I took tutorials in inorganic chemistry, biology, and physics while I was at Cambridge. But I was, you didn't know that. But I did I'm, not know that. <laughs> and I decided to study a new field, which is English. And um, to get a degree, of, to get a second BA. And at Oxford and Cambridge, your BA automatically turns into an MA in five years if you send in five pounds. <laughs> True story. The easiest MA in the whole history, you know, in all the academy. 
So often when you see these royal scholars that like, master's degree is all bullshit. They just <laughs> sent in five, five pounds and they, and they got a master's degree. So remember, I'd already been to Africa. I'd lived there. And I said, I would like to study African literature since I was getting the second uh, BA. And they, the tutor, the supervisor at Clare College, Cambridge, said, you're in luck. There is a Nigerian writer in, uh, who's here in exile from um, Nigeria. And uh, he's over at Churchill College. So maybe he'll do um, some supervisions with you. He had been rejected by the English faculty <laughs> because the English faculty at Cambridge was so racist. They said African literature wasn't really literature. It was anthropology. So his appointment was in the social anthropology department. In that, that, and 13 years later, he gets a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> My man. <laughs> Which nobody at Cambridge is going to get. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so I got to, this is the confession. So, he, I, I never heard of him. And I looked at his, look at his name. You think he's Polish, right? Wol <laughs> Swoyinka. <laughs> Wol Swoyinka. I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know nothing about him. So I put that letter, remember, in the mail to Mr. Swoyinka. <laughs> it's Wole Shoyinka, by the way. But I didn't know how to say it. And he said, I said, I would like to blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he said, well, come see me, and we'll see if this can work out. And it's a letter. So I had got my best dashiki. <laughs> I had a closet full of dashikis, baby. I had a two-foot-high afro. I know y'all can't believe this, but I did. I had some light blue sunglasses. I was styling. I was profiling. And we had the one um, African course that everybody at Yale took, all the black kids, was Robert Ferris Thompson uh, from... Uh, uh, um, from Africa to the, to, to the black, the transatlantic tradition, that's what it was called, from black Africa to the black Americas. And uh, in it, it was an art history course. And he had three slide projectors. And he would show a motif from Africa, a visual motif from Afro-Latin America, and one from black America. It was a bad course. And it, it really t it taught me a lot. But the book that we use was by Jan Heinz Jan, and it was called Muntu. And it is, um, it, nobody reads it today, but it was all the rage in the late 60s and the early 70s. And he was a German guy, and he claimed to have looked at all these various African cultures and reduced them to their repeating essence, <laughs> that there was a transcendent African uh, identity and value system. And there were like six or seven principles uh, under Muntu, like Muntu, Huntu, Wuntu, I'm making that up, but they, they all rhyme with Muntu, right? So I stayed up half the night before going over to meet him because I was trying to blow his mind, you know, to show him that I was bad, that I was hip on the Muntu thing, you know what I mean? So, so I'm walking from Calhoun College, I mean, from Clare College over to Churchill College, and Afro's kind of blowing in the wind, and I'm going, Muntu, Huntu, Noon to, you know. <laughs> so I finally find his rooms at Churchill College and I beat on the I beat on the door. And he opened the door, ladies and gentlemen, it was like that. He opened the door, he looked up and saw my afro. He went, <laughs> and he went, he went like that. <laughs> and, and he said, Okay, you can come in. And so I go in. And, you know, he's like King Wally, right? I mean, he's the same guy there, but it was 49 years ago. 49 years ago we met. That's what a blessing that is. And um, he asked me if, what I knew about Africa, and I told him I lived in Tanzania, and I told him about hitchhiking across the equator, and I'd been to Nigeria, but I told him I didn't know much about um, African literature, but I would really like to, to learn and, um, and uh, then I was taking on a new field, the study of English literature. And so, and he said, um, okay. And just when I was about to, you know, reach in my 
hip pocket and pull out my knowledge of Muntu, he said, you know something? Um, I'm going to tell you why I'm going to take you on as a student. And I said, well, why is that, sir? And he said, because you're the only African-American I ever met who didn't give me that Muntu bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so wait a minute. So what did I do? I said, Muntu? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I, as black people say, I swear for God. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> I would like to ask Wally to read. This is when <laughs> Elation Oba is doing the dance of death. And the praise singer and the mother of the market are talking to him, and he's dancing himself into the trance that's going to ever end his life. So remember, he can escort his king through the passageway of transition to the other world. Yeah, this is a Leshin and his praise singer who's um, sort of chanting him towards the abyss of transition. Praise singer and a Leshin. <clears throat> a Leshin, I love you. Can you hear my voice? Faintly, my friend, faintly. Alessia Alafi, can you hear my call? Faintly, my king, faintly. Is your memory sound, Alessia? Shall my voice be a blade of grass and tickle the armpit of the past? My memory needs no prodding, but what do you wish to say to me? Only what has been spoken, only what concerns the dying wish of the father of all. It is buried like sedium in my mind. This is the season of quick rains. The harvest is this moment due for gathering. If you cannot come, I said, swear you'll tell my favorite horse. I shall ride on through the gates alone. Elisha's message will be read only when his loyal heart no longer beats. If you cannot come, Elisha, tell my dog, I cannot stay the keeper too long at the gate. A dog does not outrun the hand that feeds it meat. A horse that throws its rider slows it down to a stop. Elisha, laughing, trusts no beasts with messages between a king and his companion. If you get lost, my dog will track the hidden path to me. The seven-way crossroads confuses only the stranger. The horseman of the king was born on the recesses of the house. I know the wickedness of men. If there is weight on the loose end of your sash, such weight as no mere man can shift, if your sash is earthed by evil minds who mean to part us at the last, my sash is of the deep purple alari. It is no tethering rope. The elephant trains no tethering rope. That king is not yet crowned, who will peg an elephant, not even you, my friend and king. And yet this fear will not depart from me. The darkness of this new abode is deep. Will your human eyes suffice? In the night which falls before our eyes, However deep, we do not miss our way. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>